Why, hello there. It's me, Jeremy, your favorite bald dude telling you about Standard and Strange, a store and a brand with simple rules. Sell clothes they themselves would wear, manufacture it ethically, and build it to last. From boots made in Oregon to loop wheel garments made in Japan, find all the best clothes for your wardrobe at Standard and Strange. Standardandstrange.com. Okay. Hello, it's Jeremy. You're listening to Blamo. How you doing? Ooh, first off, before we start, before we do anything, I got to give you all a little update. So, as you all know, or or maybe you don't, we had our second child a few weeks ago, and it has been exhausting and crazy, and I'm not sure if you know, but y- you know, we talk about the Blam fam on the pod sometimes. So, what it is is it's our members only group that we started a few years ago. It's through Patreon, and we have this Slack group of just hundreds and hundreds of users. And it's really blossomed into this amazing community. And look, of course, there are people on there that are doing fit picks because you gotta have the fit picks. People sharing sale finds to asking advice and travel guides. But it's also this place where people have gotten vulnerable and shared lots of their life, including myself. They surprised me this week with an insanely generous and loving gift for the fam. And I was moved. I mean, it was just, I'm so grateful. Uh, No matter how big this world gets, I'm so grateful for everyone saying, hey, reaching out, checking on us. I'm thinking of you, checking in. Even the text that, you know, I wasn't able to do a good response to, but just people saying, hey, um, it means a lot. And I'm incredibly grateful and yeah, I, I'm, you know, I'm just kind of shooting off the dome here. So apologies for the college radio dead air, but living a life of gratitude is really important to me. And I hope that no matter what I do in my life, and I've done a lot of dumb stuff, uh, people will know that I'm grateful. And I definitely am. And I hope that no matter what, when you hear this, you think of the things that you are grateful for and that are important to you. And that you're able to kind of, I don't know, maybe respond to that text or that phone call. Jeez, forget the text. (laughs) But whatever. On that tip, this week was a very special episode and a great conversation with an old colleague and friend of mine, Nabil Ayers. Nabil and I have known each other for, I guess, over a decade now. And when we met, he was coming on to run the U.S. side of 4AD, which was one of the few labels at um, the Beggars Group. And you'll hear this on the pod, but he was always warm and friendly, and he talked to me like a peer. And he was someone who was always encouraging me on everything I was doing at all times, even outside of working at the record label. You know, and obviously I left and did various other careers, and and Nabil and I have stayed in touch. But his life and career has had a massive ascension to new highs. He's now the president of the Beggars Group U.S., which consists of 4AD, Matador Records, XL Recordings, Rough Trade, Young, all the bangers, <laughs> like all, all the great indie labels. And he just published his memoir, My Life in the Sunshine. And it's one of the most refreshing, heartwarming, generous books I've read in years. Uh, it's a memoir about one man's journey to connect with his musician father and ultimately redrawing the lines that define family and race. Uh, you need to read it. You need to listen to the audiobook, whatever it is, but it is just beautiful, and I can't recommend it enough. Nabil came on the pod to discuss his recent memoir, the music that defined his life, seeing Nirvana before Nevermind came out, opening for Mud Honey, and how he found his way to writing and discovering his family. This is a really special episode, and I hope you enjoy it. How have things been? Because you you've done you've already done some press. And obviously, I mean, I, I saw the, what was it, the Washington Post piece that came out? Yeah, and there's an excerpt in Rolling Stone today, which is like that chapter where I meet my father for the first time, which is kind of crazy to have out there. There's, it's been good. I mean, I'm just talking about it so much. And this morning, I did a thing on Sirius XM Live. I went there, which is fun. And then I think I'm five interviews and podcasts today. Jeez. <laughs> Well, I promise this will be easy because I don't, oh, yeah, I don't care. This is all fun. I like, I mean, I'm not even close to sick of it. It's still definitely at the point where I've done a lot, but there's still like people have different enough questions and thoughts that it's like, I'm still like, oh, weird. I haven't, huh? I haven't thought about it that way. <laughs> like that's still happening. I don't feel at all like, oh yeah, that question again. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's been Damn. fun. Um, anyway, thanks thanks for making the time to Dude, chat. Thank you. I'm psyched. This is the world's colliding. Yeah, I was going to say, because we, we have a bit of a history, you and I. Yep. Uh, although I will say I had zero idea of any of this stuff when I, when I first met you, because you were just... You were just the new label head for right. 4AD. Right. Which, and why would you know, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, and I'm, but like you coming into that role, I was like, holy shit, like this is, this guy's going to run 4AD. Like this, <laughs> this is legit. <laughs> but then you were like, uh, <laughs> no, no. Well, I mean, I think that's the thing where, where, and I've said this tons of times on the pod, like it was working at Beggars, which is what we're referring to, mm-hmm. working at the Beggars group. It to me was like the, I don't know, it was like my, like, master's education of like people right. of relationships of obviously of music but i mean I, I still attribute all of the best things that happened to me in my life and like learning experiences based around that right. time wow that's cool that's a cool way to look at it yeah yeah i mean yeah it's a great i mean i've been there 13 plus 13 and a half years which is crazy mm-hmm. and i still think that i still love it yeah i mean and now you're you're the what's your correct title you're the president president of beggars us yeah I know. It's a good title, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so wait, how many, what are all the labels that are underneath beggars right now for, it's, for folks? It's XL, Rough Trade, Matador, 4AD, and Young, which was Young Turks and which became the fifth label a while ago. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And and Young was, or they, they have like the XX. Mm-hmm. and Mossy Washington, all the yeah. XX, Jamie XX and sort of associated stuff. Yeah. Did Twigs for a while. Yeah. Great stuff. Yeah. And how how has some of this stuff been? Because I I do think the you know something I want to discuss while we're chatting is the fact that you have this incredible job at as the president of yeah. of the of Beggars Group US, but you've also really been able to I don't know whether it's discover or create this sort of like side career. I right. mean, <laughs> yeah. basically, like you could just live as yourself. And normally, people of the caliber of the job that you have. They live, breathe, sleep. Their career. Right, right. Yeah, I think I just weirdly everything I'm interested in is so closely related to my job, and I think that's all sort of on purpose, and it's all good. I mean, it's always only been music, whether that mm-hmm. means playing music, putting out records, opening a record store, writing. Which is, I'm not a music writer, but it certainly affects everything I write, and is kind of part of it. So to me, it's it's actually like just one thing that I do it's that and there are all these different ways that I'm involved in it so it's like you know I don't go play tennis or do I don't don't have many hobbies (laughs) that aren't related to this because this is it and luckily I like it all so it's it's it works yeah and how many people are at beggars now in In the the US US, there's I think there's if you include all the labels and everything in that office I think there's close to 70 now it's crazy jeez yeah it's a lot and globally how many are global now I want to say 180 but I'm not sure It's a lot in the UK and then, you know, anywhere from two to five or six in lots of other countries. Yeah. And like satellite places. Yeah. Yeah. And I I think something else that's really like interesting to me too is as we've looked over the years in the, I don't know whether you want to call it like indie music or not. Mm -hmm. Like it's like working at Beggars is like the equivalent of working at Ralph Lauren in the fashion (laughs) industry. Right. To where, you know, it's the, the person that founded it is still there. Right. It's still the person in charge. Totally. And all of these people have kind of made their career at Beggars, but then jumped to other places, whether it's, you know, like Robbie Morris at, at Secretly. Yep. Um, yeah, know, that's he, totally true. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's gnarly. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Um, so your career pre all this. I mean, because where did you grow up originally? I mean, I was I was born in New York in Greenwich. Well, not born in Greenwich Village, but you know, my mom lived in Greenwich Village. I was born at New York Hospital in the Upper East Side, and uh, mm-hmm. lived in New York as a kid. Moved around a lot. Lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Amherst, Massachusetts, and then back to New York all before I was ten. So that was all kind of East Coast, all moving around a lot. Just me and my mom, single mom, mm-hmm. and uh, and then we moved to Salt Lake City when her. She worked for American Express, and we moved there because they moved there. Um, and I was there through high school, and it was great. We can get into that if we want to. But <laughs> it was actually surprisingly a great place to be. Then went to college just outside of Seattle in Tacoma, stayed in Seattle forever after college, and then moved to New York in 2008. 
that's the whole the when, whole thing. But when did your music career start, like professionally? Because I mean, you were you're in Long Winters. You've been in a bunch of different stuff. Yeah, right? definitely in Seattle. I mean, after college, I knew I went to the University of Puget Sound, which is like a small liberal arts college in Tacoma, mm-hmm. and I knew that I didn't want to get like a real job because I wanted to work in music, and more than I wanted to work in music, I wanted to play in a band. And so the thing was like, if you get a real job, I won't be able to do that. I'll have a real job. (laughs) And I don't want to be 22 and tied to that when I know it's not what I want to do. So so I got a job at a record store after college because it was the the best job in the world. What's better than that? You hang out and sell music and talk to people about music and go to shows for free and, and all that. So I loved it. And at the same time, found my way into a band playing drums in this rock band called The Lemons that was already kind of happening. And um, yeah. and it was funny because like it wasn't at all really my kind of music. They were like kind of Ramones, like a very like simple punk band, like really straight ahead, a very good band. That wasn't the thing. It just I was into more like nerdy, dissonant, indie, early 90s bands like Jawbox and stuff like that. And to me, this oh, was like, okay. they were like so straight ahead and so rock and roll. But the drummer broke his arm. And so I just filled in for one show because they had this huge show opening for Mud Honey in front of 6,000 people. And I was just friends with them. And so I was like, yeah, I will do that. Of course, that sounds great. Oh, shit. And it was super fun. And we got along great. And, and they were kind of already doing well. So pretty quick, like within a year of me joining the band, we were all 23, I think. And we signed a deal with Mercury Records. So Suddenly it was like, wow, well, so my plan worked. I didn't get a job, found a band, and now I'm on a major label and I'm 23 years old. This is great. (laughs) (laughs) My God. So is the money that you get at the time, is that like life changing? I mean, I'm not asking for specifics, but what does it feel like? It was funny because I don't remember what the advance was, but it was something like $200,000, which sounds like a lot. And which actually at the time in the early 90s wasn't a lot for like, you know, bands getting signed to major labels post Nirvana that was like, you know. There are bands that were right. getting a million dollars then, but we weren't like as hot. So, so let's say it was two hundred thousand dollars, but like you know, there's the lawyer, there's the manager, there's the business manager, there's all these people, and I, this is not at all a like we got ripped off story. This is just actually what it is. Like you know, sure. everyone gets their cut, and all those people worked for their cut. And then in the end, our manager was smart, and our business manager was smart. And he's like, "We're not going to give all you twenty-three year olds, you know, whatever, thirty thousand dollars cash each, which which would have been life changing, maybe at twenty-three right. in Seattle when my rent was one hundred fifty-four dollars a month. Like it was, <laughs> that was easy times. And so instead, yeah. what they did is they put us on salary with our own money. So the money went into the bank. We each got a thousand dollars a month." And they held, they withheld 300 for taxes. So we each got $700 a month, which never felt like much, but it always came for two years. And that was great. And that was smart. Whoa, that it is. <laughs> and that's, that's a hundred thousand dollars when you think about it pretty quickly. That's how it, for four people, that's, that's what it is. Yeah. Is is that more common now? Or, or I think it's that feels less very common now. I think people are more savvy. There's the internet now. And I think most bad people would be like, I'll take my 25 grand and I'll, do what I want with it. I'm going to, you know, I mean, I'll put it in crypto or something. Right. Yeah, right. I'll lose it all or <laughs> whatever. <laughs> but it definitely wow. never felt like we got a lot of money, but it did. It was enough that it paid our rent and we toured a lot and never, you know, no one worked. That was it. It was really fun. Did you, what did your mom think when this happened? Was she oh. like, what are you doing? Or like, no, no, going? she was, she knew that's what I was always trying to do. She was super proud and, and happy and uh, always really supportive, always came and saw us play. She lived in Berkeley at the time. So we would play you know, San Francisco or wherever. And uh, yeah, she loved it. Yeah. Yeah. And at the time, like you, because you, you got into music at a much younger age in terms of playing. Oh, right? yeah. Like, like 10? Like zero. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, okay. I mean, I was playing drums. There's just so much music around. I mean, I mean, the quick story is I don't I don't know my father. My mother met him. He's a famous musician, Roy Ayers. My mother met him and just said, like, this is the person I'm going to have a kid with. Not this is the person I'm going to marry or anything like that. It was very specific. She's, she wanted to be a young single mother and wanted to have his kid. And she asked him to, and he said yes. So that that's always been the story, and I've always known that. So... So oh, you always knew that. Always knew that. Yeah, it was never like, oh, let's wait and tell him to be old when he's old enough to understand. It was I've never not known that story. So, which is part of why it's never felt weird to me because my mother's incredible and did a great job and never complained about him because there was nothing to yeah. complain about. He did exactly what he was supposed to do. Right. So, it, you know, certainly an unorthodox plan, but but one that worked. Um, but I was always around music. I'm really close to my mother's younger brother, my uncle. He's a jazz saxophone player. My mother's a dancer. There's just always music and musicians around us. So my uncle bought me a drum set when I was two and a half. Two and a half. And there's tons, there's pictures, there's recordings of me playing drums and my uncle playing saxophone when I'm, they have dates on the tapes from like three, almost four years old, like under four years old. <laughs> 
So it was just always happening, and I never, ever thought about doing anything else. And even the business part of it, I was always interested in. I, I, I looked at records when I was a kid and noticed different you know, labels on the same records. Oh, these both say Epic or Motown, like that. I didn't know what it meant, but I knew there was something going on. I was always interested in that part of it. Right. Yeah. So fast forward, you're playing in the women's. <laughs> yeah. you're, on, you're on salary. Um, what was the first thing you did? I mean, is this like a Dave Grohl moment? Because I feel like this is somewhat similarity stuff where you fill in for the drummer. Right, get- right. Oh, that's <laughs> funny. Yeah, but Nirvana's better. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think, like, I didn't... Well, that's a good question. I mean, I think the first thing I did is when, when we signed, I definitely... We did take some of the money and buy new gear. And so I bought a beautiful, like, custom-made drum set by this guy that I'm still friends with in Seattle who made custom drums. And that was the one, like, you know, I didn't buy a car. I didn't really care about clothes. There's not, I didn't move. It wasn't enough money to do anything, like, life-changing. Right. But to suddenly have, like, the dream drum set did feel, that that was the life-changing thing. That was, like, the the trophy, I guess, Uh was this literal thing that I could see every night and that was, like, sparkly and that people would comment on, you know. It was gold sparkle. (laughs) God, it was so sick. Do you still have it? (laughs) I don't. I think, it's so funny. I'm still friends with Al, the guy that makes these drums, what would, what ended up happening is I would just like every once in a while I'd be like let's try something new and I'd kind of trade those in and he'd make me a new one and he'd sell those to somebody else I became like oh. he wasn't like so much giving me free stuff but I would be like the experiment and he'd be like I'm gonna make you this crazy set give me the gold ones back here's this green one and I would take that out for a year like that kind of thing it was really fun oh damn that's sick <laughs> yeah what what was your drum setup in the lemons it was super simple and kind of it's always been this like a four piece. A yep. normal 22-inch bass drum. Whoa, 22? Yeah, that's normal. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Does that seem big I guess you? I just played in a lot of shitty punk bands, and we all had, like, toy <laughs> Small bass drums. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think 22 ahead. is normal. For a while, I played a 24. That was really fun, but, like, oh, you could almost feel the air in it. It was a little too big. Right, right. Um, what did John Bonham have? What was it, like, 28 24 or, or 26, probably. Yeah, something big. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, like, uh, in, the lemon, in that, that gold set, though, had a really deep tom. So I think it was a 13, which is a little bigger, but it was like maybe 13 by 13. It looked like a cannon, not like a mm-hmm. shallower thing. And then a normal, like, 16-inch floor tom and snare. I mean, I think I would just swap out snares all the time, but some six and a half inch metal thing. Yeah. Probably. And then <laughs> getting, this is great. No one's ever asked me these questions in the last 20 years. Oh, welcome to the show. <laughs> and then I did get, so I got a Sabian symbol endorsement, which was really fun because those, they never, I don't think they gave me free stuff, but they gave me 70% off, which basically felt free. And so, yeah. um, and I still have some of those symbols. I had 15 inch hi hats, which is the key, which sounds big, but they just sound better. They just sound so good. And, uh, yeah. and then like 18 and 19 inch crashes and a 21 inch ride. I think that was it. That's a pretty legit setup. It was fun. It's like a rock set. Like everything was like a little bit bigger because if you hit it harder and I hit so hard then, I mean, I used to go to a sports medicine doctor and I was like really trying. <laughs> oh, wow. Did you, did you have like formal training for for music like could you read music no not even close i mean that's the one thing that's that's funny about sort of being self-taught is that that's all i know and so it was fun to be i mean i had a drum set i was a child and i would just Mm -hmm. play along with records and and, you know we always had friends who were drummers and people would sit with me for an hour and teach me a thing or two but i never had even when i had a real drum teacher for a while he was great about i think pretty early on just realizing like his job is not to like try to teach me to read music because i just didn't care i didn't want to it was more to like turn me on to more music than what I know and like would bring over like mm. Brazilian records and like jazz and just stuff that I'd never heard, which was really fun. So he really just kind of opened my mind to a bunch of different stuff and would like, wouldn't even necessarily, sometimes I could figure it out. Sometimes we would just sit there for an hour and we'd play it and he'd be like, what do you think? And I would try to play it and he would be like, wow, great. Or he'd be like, no, no, I think they're doing this. Like it was, it was really fun. What were you playing along to? Like what, what are like records that you hear them and you're like, I learned how to play this. Right. I mean... This is early MTV for me, like early 80s. I mean, I'm 50 now. So this is like in 82, I was 10. That's when we moved to Salt Lake City and got MTV. So Mm -hmm. this was on the sort of easy side. It was like Def Leppard Pyromania. Um, Hell yeah. And on the more challenging side, that was like Rush Moving Pictures, Tom Sawyer, Limelight and those songs. And like The Police, Ghost in the Machine. Whoa. Trying to play with those records, which was like, you know, super challenging, but also really fun to, to try to do. And I would come home from school, put on headphones. 
and that's what I would do for a couple hours. Wow. It was great. <laughs> and no one complained. We had neighbors. We actually lived in an apartment in Salt Lake, and it was fine as long as it was like three to five when people were at work. That's crazy. Yeah, like I know a lot of people that would, you know, learn and play drums, but it would be like, oh, I'm going to play Kiss right. or I'm going to well, play. I did that when I was like five. I think I just had to jump on all of it. <laughs> Kiss when you were five. Yeah. <laughs> What are you, oh, I feel, it's interesting because you said kiss when you're five in the sense like, Harry, I have a kiss, an old kiss t-shirt. It's a vintage one. It's not a repro. <laughs> nice. And um, Harriet loves it, my, my four-year-old daughter. And I think it's just because they look like clowns. I mean, she yeah. doesn't know any other rock band. Right. You know. it's, there's something about Kiss and kids, though, and I think there still is, not as much as there was then when it was like current. and when it, But I mean, it was made for kids, I think. And I was just yeah. so susceptible because I was... In my early years, it was like jazz and really good, important music. And then I got heard Kiss and saw it and it was just like, oh, this is it. That's all I care about. Yeah. Well, I mean, just the, the concept of performance and the fact that they didn't even have real names. and Yeah, it was like superheroes yeah. with guitars. <laughs> yeah. I know, and, it's and true. a cat who played drums. Or whatever. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> it it doesn't sound that great on paper, does it? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So fast forward, you're playing in Lemons and how does that evolve from there? So... Let me. So that I was in that band for about three years, and it was really fun. I still stay in touch with those guys. We uh we made a record for Mercury, came out, didn't do like really didn't do well, but like Mm -hmm. that's but that's kind of what happened to most bands then. And that's I think that's still what happens to a lot of bands on major labels now. Or now your record might not even come out, but like the fact that we got to record it and have it come out and go on tour, even that was like wow this is you know this doesn't happen to everyone and we knew it at the time because we had friends i mean everyone in seattle was getting signed Mm -hmm. so that band kind of we got dropped by mercury and they had to give us i think maybe even more money to leave which was funny (laughs) because there was a contract for another now yeah yeah (laughs) so we used but we we we're smart i mean well we did the right thing i don't know if we were smart but what we did greg the singer was like let's make another really good, really expensive record as if we're on the label because they just gave us this money and that will hopefully get us on another label. So we did that on our own um, and it never got picked up and it's never come out, but but that was a, Wait, it. Never came out. Never came out. But it, and we, you know, we had a manager and we shopped it and everything. And but that I, I do think that was a cool thing to do. That's better than like, cool, let's split the money because then you're definitely done. At least it was like, let's try to do this. Not it wasn't a time when you could do it on yourself on your own the way you can now. But it was a time where yeah. it's like, cool, we have enough money to go to a real studio with a real producer as if we are on a major label, and then see if we can sell this to somebody. Basically, so it didn't work. And at the same time. My good friend Lance, who's still one of my best friends, who was in like he was in a pop band that I would call, you know, like a way more jangly pop band. And I was in like this mm-hmm. rock band. And he kinda I think his he left his band or was breaking up and and one day he was like, Hey, will you just come over and play on some of my four track demos? I was like, Yeah, of course. So we played on tons of his songs. I still have these recordings and I really love them. It was like twenty songs. And we were just like, I'd listen to him once and then play with him live and we recorded it. And then like <laughs> a week later, Lance was like, Yeah, so uh we're starting a band. I know these two women, they're really cool and good looking. Neither of them plays an instrument, but they will, and that's the band. <laughs> I was like, that, what are you talking about? But but Lance is like a super, like, he's an incredible entrepreneur and like a really convincing, just like talented guy. And so he's like, just, we're all going to get together. Come over. We're just going to like hang out and have drinks with them and maybe try playing. And we did. And oddly enough, of course, Amy could really sing. And Jenny, the bass player, just like picked it up immediately. And so we, this is funny because none of this is in the book because it was just too many bands. But so we started this band called Micro Mini in Seattle. This is like in 1996 or something. Okay. And did really well and like, you know, sold out shows and got on the radio and played South by Southwest. And we were like a big local band. But of course, it was still a time when it's like either you get signed or you don't. And those are the two things. It was very hard to have anything in between. Yeah. Right. And we weren't like cool enough to be at the time on like, you know, Up Records or K or Sub Pop and those labels. Like it was a little too commercial for that. Right. So we kind of had to be on a major label and that didn't happen. And so that band eventually fell apart. And then I ended up in a band called alien crime syndicate that's like like a rock band but more i mean maybe closer to weezer like very melodic fun yeah i mean i I listened to alien crime syndicate yeah and acs was super (laughs) fun and that came from there was a band called the mises who were this great san francisco band that when i was in the lemons we toured with the mises so i became friends with them and joe the singer broke up the mises started acs and then when the drummer quit he moved to seattle and that's so i just naturally joined that band and that was super fun too and that was like that was fun because that's when you know now i'm like i don't know at the time i was like probably close to 30 i owned like my partner and i 
opened a record store called Sonic Boom Records in Seattle. And that was going well. And we were like making money for the first times in our lives, which is wild to be 30 and like have savings and like be able to do things. And so, yeah, so ACS made a record that I, I mean, again, it's so funny. It all comes back to this. It's like, well, we can't get signed. So what do we do? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was like, look, I have let me put it out. I'll start a label. It's called, I'm going to call it the control group. I don't know that much about it, but I know something. I own a record store. I'll press a couple thousand CDs. I'll hire a real publicist. We knew a publicist. and uh, So this is high fidelity in real life. Yeah, totally. But for my own band. And so we did. Yeah. And it really worked. And it was, it was super like gamed, which was what was so fun about it. We had this song called Ozzy that we thought was like our hit single. Uh -huh. So we pressed a CD single of it and got, anyway, we got that song like on a couple of radio stations, which is not easy, but like people knew people and we got favors and sort of mm -hmm. that got this buzz going where major labels became interested because that was the metric then. It's like if you're on the radio, that, that was like whatever, right. YouTube views or Spotify plays, like that was the only thing you could quantifiably look at or sales, of course, but the album wasn't out yet. So, so, uh, so I had a contract with the band. I was putting out the record and we put it out, but the goal was always to like, oh, but if we could sell it to a bigger label and have them pick it up. So we ended up doing that with V2, who at the time were killing it. They had the White Stripes and they had Moby playing. Yeah. Like two really V2, big records. Was that like a virgin? Label? It was, yeah, because it was Richard Branson. Yeah, it was his like yeah. other thing. Okay. So we signed with them. They put out the record and it was the same thing. We're like, I think they tried and they were nice people, but like it totally didn't. <laughs> didn't take off and yeah here we were again but that band was even more fun because i think everyone had kind of been through it like had been in other bands that hadn't done what they were supposed to so like we even more appreciated the chance we had and and the money and everything and we did crazy th i mean we did a tour of amusement parks with sugar ray like really like <laughs> weird stuff <laughs> is this is is this like peak sugar ray this is post peak sugar ray but still like you know they're big at the six flags park at the time yeah they're yeah. still selling out places and oh yeah there's still thousands of people it was like a lot of college shows it was really really fun and they were super nice guys too they were great yeah are you still in touch with any of these folks like are you know you texting mcgrath uh <laughs> <laughs> no no but i only have good thoughts of mark mcgrath i'm not into we did stay in touch with them though for a while with stan the drummer who was kind of the guy because they came and played seattle and we all went i remember but uh but no not in touch with sugar ray but i'm in touch i mean all my ex-bandmates from all these bands i'm still friends with which is fun yeah do they all have podcasts now <laughs> I don't think any of them do. Isn't that, that's crazy, right? That is crazy. I do feel like if you were in a band then, right. or if you're in a band now, mm -hmm. so many bands are starting podcasts. I think it's a great idea, especially if, if you can, you know, if you have your music right. and you can use your own music and stuff. But uh, yeah, I, I it's, there's so many other bands and especially now where like, we don't have to get too deep into this, where I feel like with Spotify, like new music and old music compete at the same level. To where, right. you know, I'm discover. you know, there are people that are discovering like Weezer's Pinkerton for the first time, <laughs> oh, you know, and are just record. like losing, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And they're like losing their mind over it. Yep. Um, versus I think historically you had the radio and you were just competing against other things that were new. Right. Now it's just everything. It, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's everything at the same time. Um, but like with, with all of that experience that you're, you know, you're able to understand here because correct me if I'm wrong. You get you get the experience of being a musician, um, being in a band, being signed, not being signed anymore, right? Uh, n being a sort of like member of a larger band, mm -hmm. going on all, lots of tours, uh, starting your own record store. Mm -hmm. Which I mean, I'll say this because you didn't like Sonic Boom Records is like historic <laughs> now. I mean, it it is it's because you guys and you guys sold Sonic Boom we sold later, it right? in 2016 yeah what six years ago but, <laughs> but we opened it I mean in 1997 it's turning 25 this year that's so, so crazy cool. <laughs> but yeah. like y you get the full taste of every aspect of the music industry right. and now you're you're you know the president of a incredibly well-respected successful group of labels yeah. I I'm you know as I'm saying this I'm realizing like how much do you think this is done in terms of your empathy towards other bands? I mean, I know, let me just be clear, the industry is nowhere near what it right, was. Right, it's totally different. But like, yeah. you, you've now been there. You've been, you've got to experience every part of it. Yeah, it's done a lot on both sides, meaning sometimes it's like, you know, we have to do this because this is what the band wants to do. And it doesn't matter <laughs> if it's, if we think it's the right thing or if it's too expensive, like, sure, let's do it. What, or, or like sometimes the question I'll even ask is like when it, when people at the label are like, well, we shouldn't do that because we know it won't work. And maybe we're right. But 
But sometimes the question is like, right, but can we just sit here for a minute and think about how we can do it instead of why we shouldn't? Like this, sometimes I find myself asking those questions from not as if I'm in the band, but at least trying to think like we put out lots of records, but this is one person's record. It's very important to them. How can we at least just stop for a second and think about that and try to see it from their perspective and not do everything? They, you know, obviously not do everything, but you know, I, I had a really funny conversation with one of our band's managers recently. He he's really interested in all the book stuff because um, I think he has an mm-hmm. artist who wants to write a book and so he always asks me and I was telling him recently I was like it's crazy I forgot how it feels to be in a band but now that my book is coming out it reminds me of it and I'm stressed and I'm you know I know we're not going to get everything but I'm calling the publicist and I'm emailing all the time and I know I'm bothering mm-hmm. people and I want this and it's it's so stressful and he's like that's great everyone who works in the music business should have to put out something creative every 10 years just to let them know what it feels like so they can relate to the to like more, recertify which is, which is yeah totally <laughs> which is a really good point but the other thing i will say on the opposite side of the spectrum is there's times when it's like a band maybe not a big band or an artist gets a really good opportunity and they're like well we're not going to drive overnight from san francisco to la to play that radio session in the morning that's crazy and and most people will be like yeah that is really hard and my thing is like get in the fucking van like what <laughs> what are you talking about <laughs> <laughs> you you absolutely have to do this. This is this is not for us. This is for you. This is your career. What right. you can't one person can't stay up all night. I mean, like you know, I really err hard on that side of things. Like of just like when you have those opportunities, you do it. That's it. When right. are you going to be in San Francisco again? Oh, sure, maybe we'll be able to get it next album. That's a terrible plan. Yeah, <laughs> or or like I think that especially with with it feels like trends are really quick mm-hmm. in this sense. Yeah. And, and where it's like, if you're hot, like you gotta, you gotta be as hot as you can during this time. Cause who knows what your window looks like. Right. Yeah. That's gnarly. Yeah. Damn. But it's fun. And, and, and I'm usually alone in those <laughs> when I feel like that. And I don't feel like that with anything, but if it's like a real opportunity, it's like, they should, this is crazy. This is not the time to like, think about sleep. Right. That's not why we're here. <laughs> well, and I, it's, I think there's also a bit of experience that maybe some of the younger bands like aren't totally aware of because now a lot of people will feel like so empowered by the tools that are in front of them where it's like, totally. who needs a press release? I'm going to go live right now on my phone totally. to all these people yeah, and yeah. announce this. Yeah, there's so and you're many like, different well, ways to get to people. Yeah. And it's like, is that that effective? Like I've John Caramonica. Uh, New York Times yep. pop music uh, critic. I mean, you know him. He talks about this a lot. Where he was like, "So what? You know, what good is is any of these like tools to some of these musicians now when they can also be like, you know, I'm paraphrasing him, mm-hmm. but he, he's talking about where they can also be like pretty dangerous. Where it's like, who needs a manager if you can just ask your followers what you should do? You know, or who needs? And it's like, well, who are your followers? What relationship do you have with them? Like, how do you you quantify that right. in, in something that's thorough? Like, who is in your corner when really at the end of the day, you also have like an, some algorithm you don't understand that's like pushing your shit. I mean, it's, right. it's nuts. I know, it's, I, and I'll never really understand it. But there are people <laughs> who are good at it and who can, you know, cut through, but not everybody. Yeah. I think there's so much, I mean, I, you know, during the pandemic, lots of artists, and we did really well with this, instead of doing, you know, 10 radio sessions along the tour, mm-hmm. we would tape one thing at a sound studio or a studio somewhere and parcel it out to different stations and different songs and do the interviews on Zoom and all this stuff. And I think there's definitely some artists and people in our office and people in lots of positions who are like, oh, wow, well, that's the new model. Now we don't have to, artists don't have to go to those 10 stations. And again, my 90s dude in me is like going to the 10 stations is the benefit it's the reason to do what you're doing not the something you have to do to make it work like that's that's part of the thing you go on tour so you can meet people so you can meet those djs at the stations like it's one person at a time it's like hand-to-hand combat and it's competitive and if you're good at it and you're nice and you meet people and you do that for years you can have a career right and i think a lot of people like wow they don't have to do that anymore it's like that's (laughs) <laughs> That's like, but again, I'm, I'm I'm often alone <laughs> with these things. And you know, something no one talked about in the '90s was mental health, or at least in my world. And that, of course, is something that should be considered, and that I think people are much better about considering now. So, but yeah, I think, but you're you're also a person because I remember when you were when you were starting at Beggars, 
everybody, you had a, you had a serious reputation <laughs> bef- before. Come on. I'm serious. It, no, 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 no. Let, let me, okay. let me, let me explain here. You had a, a reputation amongst your peers and other people in the industry of being, you know, very warm, charismatic, a person with a ton of ideas. And what I'm trying to communicate here is you got that by meeting other people, right, by right. being around, by you know, it was, it wasn't the intentional interaction that you might have with someone. It was something that came unintentional from the interaction. Right, right. Just from, right. from being out there and doing the stuff. Because yeah, it's and, fun I mean, and, to do the stuff. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> right. Like, I mean, my whole fucking career is, is based off of like, people like, oh yeah, I know Jeremy. He's a nice guy. Totally. You're like, and, and so <laughs> when you, I remember when you came into beggars, everyone's like, oh dude, yeah. oh, I remember Nabil, dude. And, oh yeah, and Sonic Boom. And he did this thing. And the, so like, you already had that. Um, so being someone who has benefited from like being the nice guy, right. you know, has that made you, you know, again, like kind of be a little bit more, you know, when, when you're interacting with other people, like, is, is there just much more empathy? I think so. I, and, but it's hard. Cause like I, whatever I'm doing, whatever has worked for me has been natural. I like talking to people. I like meeting people. I like <laughs> figuring around and not, not everyone likes that and not everyone. And especially the people who don't like it aren't going to be as good at it because it feels forced or it feels like something they have to do. So it's, it's unfair right. of me to sit here and be like, well, when I was in bands, I went to every radio station. So every band should go to every radio station. You know, yeah. that's, and I'm not hearing that. But right. Yeah, right. I but that's, you know, sometimes I really like go too far down that, like <laughs> everyone should do everything <laughs> road, which is pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> Someone always puts me in check though. It's okay. <laughs> well, that's, that's all right. I think the difference is, do you listen to that person or not? And I think, being receptive to feedback is also the like incredible skill set that one can create these right, days. Right. So as you're kind of summoning Everest here in your career, mm-hmm. the big pivot where to me it felt like, oh shit, like Nabil's like writing about very personal stuff. Right. What was the shift that caused you, or at least to publicly mm-hmm. cause you to look inward? I think both privately and publicly. I mean, I all the stuff with my father. And my race, and he's black, my mother's white. I've just never, I've made it. This episode is brought to you by Standard and Strange. Where are the summer fits at? Is it too hot? Look, you know, I've always been one of those less is more folks, and I just tend to wear a bright color. Hello, yellow. But lately, I've been feeling the Joe McCoy pocket tees from Standard and Strange. They have a cherry red and a forest green, and wow, they are so good. Because it's hard to get pocket tees right. But these are 100% cotton, garment dyed, which means they're dyed after they're actually assembled and made. And they're made in Japan. Oh, and did I mention they're only available at Standard & Strange? Look, if you're still thinking, just head over to standardandstrange.com and see why they're one of my favorite shops. Their selection of denim, boots, sportswear is incredible. And geez... What other retail store donates 2% of their revenue, not profits, to giving back? I love these folks. So should you. Visit standardandstrange.com to learn more. And be sure to sign up for their mailing list so you never miss the latest dope gear they have at standardandstrange.com. Okay, so you're ready for it. You're ready to get your watch. Whether you're celebrating a life event, you just want to flex, or you want to see some amazing watches, you got to visit my friends at Topper Jewelers. Located in the heart of Silicon Valley, California, Topper has the watch you want now, the grail watch for the future, and exclusive pieces you've never seen before. But right now, Topper has an exclusive box set edition of the incredible new Ultracron from Longines. By the way, this is how you revive a king. It has the original Longines high-frequency automatic caliber, an ultra-chronometer certification for accuracy. It's water-resistant to 300 meters, so you can do whatever your heart desires with it on. And did I mention the special box set is available in limited quantities exclusively at Topper Jewelers? So listen, get on over to their shop, or look, let's just be honest, visit them online if you want at topperjewelers.com. Check out the return of the Longines ultra Cron at topperjewelers.com. That's T-O-P-P-E-R jewelers.com. You like watches? You like to talk about them? You like vinyl? You like vintage? You like vintage vinyl? You like video games? Look, they're all available on Whatnot and even more. Whatnot is a community marketplace that provides members with a safe place to meet online to share their collectible items to buy, sell, and more. 
It's a platform for collectors interested in buying and selling authentic collectible items of all kinds. Look, before I go crazy here, here's what I love about Whatnot. I get to actually have a relationship with the people I'm buying from. There's now a face to my purchases. And when you're getting watches like your boy, it's paramount. But there's more. This season, you can join me, your favorite bald dude, on Whatnot for our exclusive show and hang session all about watches. Click the link in the show notes to download the app to check it out. We'll learn about some of my favorite brands with some of the most notable people in the industry. We'll chat about watches and yes, even give away some incredible pieces in the process. So download the app on your app store or sign up online at whatnot.com to get started. Whatnot.com. Through life, I don't want to say easily, but like without any major hurdles that a lot of people in my position probably would ever have experienced, meaning really overt racism. Um, you know, I, my mom was really good to kind of raise me in great, supportive, safe places and, and around really diverse groups of people. So it it worked and I never felt like I stood out and, you know, everything was great. And so, and even like through adulthood, like working at Sonic Boom and playing in bands and everything, there's like this protective layer of you just like kind of do what you have to do to get through. So like there were plenty of scary things that happened when I was on tour, but like they were just isolated incidents and they happened and you move on and I would forget and, you know, whatever, see someone with a swastika tattoo walking down the street, like crazy shit. Oh, that's shit. really scary. Like I need to get yeah. out of here. That person's going to kill me. Like that's what goes through your head when you see that it might or might not be true, but like, you know, so like things like sure. that, but like, but then it just goes away. And so I, I Five years ago, I would have said, like, yeah, it's been easy and it's been fine and, you know, everything's great. And uh, and so I wasn't thinking a lot about it internally. And I started writing just for fun, like all the fun stuff I was writing about, touring and bands, but like the funny stories and record store fun stories and all that. And started publishing a few things and, and really liked that. And I didn't play in bands anymore. And that kind of reminded me of playing in a band. It felt like a similar creative outlet, like you know, mm. oh, I put this thing out and it's published in The Stranger and now people can tweet it like it was really fun. And yeah. my wife is the one who said like, yeah, yeah, this is all great. You can write about your record store and your bands. It's really fun. But like you need to write about your father and your race because that's what you want to talk about or that's what that's what you find interesting. And that's what people will find interesting. And when she said that, I remember what it felt like. I remember thinking like, Ugh. it's like like when you're like when you give someone a, an assignment, like, you, I don't know, it felt like school. It felt like I, but I've been getting straight A's and you just <laughs> right. told me that like, now I have to join this class where everyone's better and I'm going to get a D and I have to work harder and I have to think and I have to dig deeper. Like, can I just keep doing this? But I knew I was like, but she's right. And so that's when I started taking these memoir writing classes and, and just like writing about. Wait, you took classes? I took classes right then. I mean, it's New York, which is great. So I just enrolled in this every Monday night thing from seven to 10. And I've never taken the class more seriously. I mean, I graduated from college, but I hated the school part of it. I never went to classes. <laughs> I graduated with like a 2.2, but I, whatever, I was a great DJ at the radio station and put on parties and did all the stuff that relates to my career. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and I loved this class. I went every single time. I got there early. I talked to the teacher. I emailed the teacher when I found interesting articles. I like, like poured myself into it because I just loved it. And so right. that's where a lot of the writing came from was these kind of like prompts at the beginning of the class. They would say, you know, whatever, write about the most scared you've ever been, write about this or that. And you just have to write for 30 minutes without stopping. And, mm. and I always did that. I was really good about convincing myself like everything I'm writing right now is just for me. No one ever has to see this let alone even get published. Like, you don't, you know, she would ask if someone wanted to read, but if you didn't want to, you could just say no. So it was never, there's never a fear that like someone's going to find this. So once I got past that idea, it was really easy for me to just, just for myself, just like write about really personal stuff. Mm -hmm. And when I started doing it, it just, I mean, I've always heard this, but like, it just leads to more. You write one little story and then it's like, oh, right. And that's connected to this. And like, it kind of leads to another thing. So I just started writing about the handful of times I'd met my father, which is not that many. It's like four or five in my life, all pretty quick interactions as a kid. Um, mm -hmm. And that didn't take very long. Once I'd written like four or five short stories, then I started writing about, he has like a pretty famous song called Everybody Loves the Sunshine. Yeah. I hear it all the time. <laughs> I hear it more than ever these days. It's in commercials and movies. So I, I started writing about that, like what it feels like when I walk into a bar and the song comes on or when it's in a movie with you know, plenty. Of, so I had like all these little stories that spanned decades and i'd written a bunch of record store and band and fun stuff and there's a point where i was like oh weird i wonder if this could be a book and if i could like 
figure out, I mean, music is obviously the thread, but like how I could tie it together and still didn't tell anyone I was doing that. But in my head, I was like, I think I'm writing a book, but I didn't want to say it in case it didn't work. <laughs> and I didn't right. want to be wrong, which is funny, but, um, but that was really the point. And this is like four years ago where I, I think I was like, I'm going to try to do this and did, <laughs> which is crazy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, cause I think some of the stuff that you're, you're calling out to, it's like, there's almost like this pattern of behavior that, you know, and I think maybe it's your undercutting yourself or what, but like, you know, people don't just kind of fall into bands right. and get good and get successful uh, and then, and start a business and get really successful from it. I mean, there is some form of like underlying talent behind this, but a lot of these things, it sounds like it was also a part of like a collective. And as you're writing now, this is all individual. This is your experience. Right. This is you. Totally. Was it a different like dopamine totally. hit when you're like, in the times over this stuff? <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> right, because even at my absolute best, when you know when I was in the, playing drums in the long winters and so, whatever, we got a good pitchfork review or our picture shows up somewhere cool. I still yeah. didn't write those songs. I didn't write those lyrics. Yep. You know, and I, I I loved playing drums in bands, but I always knew I was like, I'm kind of I'm the side guy. I'm not the original drummer, and I'm not going to be the next drummer. Like you know, all of that as a drummer is right. like all the drummer jokes are true. So this is, yeah, this is a totally different thing where it's like, not only am I the singer and the songwriter, but I'm like a solo artist. Like there's, there's nobody else. I'm the only mm -hmm. person who's doing it or who's saying it. There's nobody, if someone plays a wrong note, I can't look back <laughs> and act like the bass player did it. <laughs> All the band analogies hold true. So it's, I mean, so much more vulnerable, so much more scary, but yeah, to your point, more reward, but that's not really what it feels like. It's like, I mean, it was really exciting when I got to publish a piece in the New York Times for the first time. But but what was so... How, how did that happen? Just, that was crazy. Because I mean, it wasn't the first piece you wrote. It wasn't. But... I'd written a couple of things, but certainly nothing that big. And I was... My uncle, Alan Brofman, I'm really close with still. He's a jazz saxophone player. And he released this really amazing, like, you know, crazy, noisy, free jazz album in 1975 on this very small but respected label called India Navigation. Mm -hmm. And it's long out of print, and I never knew that it was like sort of a collector nerd record, and that you know, it oh. was like $100 on Discogs, and there's a terrible YouTube rip that had 10,000 plays. I was like, this is crazy. I, I thought I was the only person that knew about this. And so I talked to him. I was like, we should reissue it. I think this is like, I mean, definitely was. I was like, this is the time. People care about this music. People love reissues. Like, let's do it. So I did. And part of what worked is, I mean, I, I run a much bigger record company, but I did this separately on my own. And I was like, mm -hmm. this is not going to make money. That's not the goal. This is like passion, family, fun thing. So I'm not going to like, I'm not going to hire a publicist because no one can tell this story. But I know enough writers and I can get people's emails. So I'll just do the press to save money. And because I just, no one's going to tell it better than I am. So I'll just kind right. of, so I kind of committed a year to it so that I really gave myself a lot of time. So, because I have a busy job. So it, you know, so I could kind of take my time and, um, and just started emailing all these people. And at the same time, I was talking to my uncle so much then and we were, you know, finding artwork and getting all this stuff. And so I was like, wow, I've been writing a lot. I really should be writing about this while this is happening. There's so many memories coming back and all this stuff. So I just kind of secretly started like writing about it, writing about the apartment where he lived in New York when it was recorded because I spent a lot of time there as a kid. There's a song on the album named After Me. Like I really feel connected to this album. So it was really fun to like, it's almost like journaling about it and putting memories and kind of crafted it into this like 1500 word. That's usually the length. This 1500 word piece and was like, man, I would love to get this published in some New York outlet, meaning like whatever, New York Mag, The New Yorker, The New York Times. I mean, yeah. you know, there's not... <laughs> Not a lot of small ones, only the biggest one. Yeah. And I was like, I have no idea how to do that. Um, and so it was actually, it was Carrie, the publicist at 4AD. I talked to her and she was super helpful. She's like, I can, I can at least, she's like, actually, I think it's not a music thing. I think it's about, it was a really smart thing she did. She's like, it's about, this, it's about the building. Cause it kind of was about 501 Canal Street, this place where all this music and these people lived. Mm -hmm. She's like, so I want to, there's one editor at Metro, which is like the New York section of the New York Times. Yeah, She's like, yeah. I'm going to send it to him and see what he thinks. And I got super lucky. Cause like, I remember hearing, she was like, he's not, he thinks it might be a little too kind of niche and inside. I don't know. And I was getting scared because it had like a timeline on it in my head around the album. And then I ran into a friend who's a writer and was telling him and he's like, oh, I know that editor. Let me, let me shoot him in a note. And I think like eventually there are just like a few people kind of like circling around it. Oh, okay. And the editor is like, okay, let's do it. And then it was really scary for a minute because then it almost went away because the, the editor called me and he was like, so wait a minute, you wrote this and it's about 
your uncle in this album and you're releasing the album and i was like yeah oh. <laughs> and he's like that's good we're gonna have to take this to the ethics committee that might be hard yeah. you writing about your own product you're going to promote and he's like i understand it's a free jazz record and that you're not going to get rich doing this but like technically so actually we ended up changing a lot of the stuff in the piece it says like the recording it never refers to it as an album or a product or a thing it's really interesting right and so uh but, but yeah, long story short, that was a crazy huge thing to be able to do. And we did a photo shoot with me and my uncle for the New York Times. And there's a picture of the two of us together and like, and also a picture of the two of us together in that building when I'm three years old and he's 21. Like, it's really crazy and cool. Damn. So yes, that was a good so, dopamine <laughs> fix. Well, that came yeah. Out. <laughs> but I mean, it also, I mean, because I remember when that happened, I was like, wait, Nabil's writing about, I was like, what? And then there was all these things. And I think, you know, and some of this is my own just like idiocy where I'm like, man, like I knew Nabil for so long and I never asked him about his dad or his parents. And I'm like, should I have done that? Like, should I have tried to have a deeper? I mean, because right. obviously we weren't really peers per right. se. Right, no, we were hanging out you know? the subway and stuff though. But, that, but, yeah, that's, but and, none of that's your fault. The answer is no. I mean, you could have done that certainly, but I now know definitively because 50 of my friends have said something like that to me in the last couple of weeks <laughs> from, from oh, every <laughs> period of my life because I've been posting so yeah. much stuff on socials and like sort of short clips from the book and like, you know, way yeah. more personal stuff than ever just in the last couple of weeks. And everyone is like, uh, I never knew this. You never talked about it or the times that I tried to mention it to you. I've had a few people say like, you got really just like defensive and cold really quickly. So like, it's not, you're not the only person I know for a fact that Anytime it came up, I was just like, yeah, yeah, I don't know my father. You know, like it, I was yeah. very quickly put up the like the wall. And now by course putting out this book, the fact that I'm talking about it and doing interviews and all this, the floodgate has opened in a good way. I mean, I'm, I'm asking for it completely. I realize that. So so now everybody is I mean, I there's people I've known for 20 years who are telling me story. They're like, I never told you about the time I met your dad in the 90s. And I'm like, that's crazy. Why didn't you tell me that? Like, ah, it just never seemed like you wanted to talk about him. And they're right. <laughs> I mean, and this is this is the thing, too, where it's like, is is this, be, you know, what is the shift that you feel OK now? Because, I mean, obviously, if you were going from not mm -hmm. and I understand, like, and, and I, I'm not looking for you to make me feel better for not asking oh, no. you. I, I think people in general should try to have as deep of a relationship as they can with individuals because right. you just don't know what the the term of the relationship is going to look like. But like, w what was the shift internally where you're like, OK, I'm going to talk about this now, but now I'm actually going to like lead my identity I with know. this. <laughs> this is polar 180. It's, change, it's changing everything, right? It's all, I mean, yeah, it's, it is. It's a polar 180 and it's like, it's just seriously putting it all out there. And I think it's actually just to like, and maybe, maybe it's getting older. I turned 50 this year. I mean, obviously it didn't just happen now. I've been working on this for years. Right. But right. some of it is like, I think all those times, those Hundreds and hundreds of times that people have said, oh, your dad's coming to town. I see his plan. What was it like growing up with him? And me being like, ah, I didn't grow up with him. Fuck off. You know, I didn't say that, but like some version sure. of that or, or like what? I mean, just like so many of those. And every time I have to do that, even though I act like I don't care, even though it's really quick and I cut it off and change the subject. I think every one of those times has impacted me. And I think part of this is a way to stop doing that and to just be like i don't need to do that maybe if i just let everything yeah. out people will stop asking me or it'll be easier for me to talk about or i can just say read the book or whatever but like <laughs> it's just a weird way to like seriously just like open the floodgate <laughs> and like let it all out and yeah. see what happens it's not i'm not really worried i'm sort of anxious of course i wonder what he's gonna think and what his side of the family who i don't know is gonna think but but also to me and i hope i mean i think the book's really positive and it's not there's some down points yeah, I mean, but I, i've read it's it it's not discouraging it it's not at all like a tell-all or thing to like make him feel bad i think in the end it's actually like a huge thank you and the, the title of my life in the sunshine is like it's a lyric from his song, but I love the title yeah. because it's super optimistic. It's like all the great things I got from him. That's my life in the sunshine, even though he wasn't part of my life. Yeah, because I mean, it doesn't read like this, like catcher in the rye sort of thing where, but, but it, I think it does speak to how ununique all of us really are. Like we all have things that happen to us that are very unique and very mm -hmm. different. And I think many of us can feel like we're the only people right. where that happens right. to. But you realize that this has happened to others mm -hmm. and you can still, I don't want to use the word recover, but you can still evolve from that. Right. Right. And, 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 and not, because I think this is a, a 
a whole other thing, and I'm not going to get too into this, where you hit a certain age in your life, and I've wrestled with this a bunch recently, mm-hmm. where you basically choose whether or not you're going to hold parents accountable to the wrongs or rights that they did to you. Right. And eventually you have to just f- live your own life as an adult. You know, like yeah. I publicly reamed my mom out wow. at General Green. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> that, oh, I remember that place on DeKalb. Yeah. <laughs> I fucking, I'm oh, sitting there no. with my mom at General Green and I ream her out because I wanted this, like, I told her how much I wanted this other life and I wanted this other stuff. Right. And there was all this anger that came out and I apologized to her and I was like, you know, after I said it, uh, and I was like, you know, I wish you would have done this and I wish you would have done this and this didn't happen and this didn't happen. And then my mom, my mom's response in tears, by the mm-hmm. way, was, I'm sorry, I was trying my best. Wow. And it fucking hit me in the head. <laughs> oh my God. That's intense. <laughs> Right. And you're just like, oh, and especially now as a parent yeah, and as a, yeah. a, a, you know, a failing adult and whatever that looks like and versus the, the optics of whom I want to be, you know, what you're actually living like, you realize, oh, yeah, I'm just trying my best too. like, yeah. you know, sorry, Harriet, I showed you kiss late or whatever. It's just like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's crazy. I don't know. But like I, when I was reading that, I got more emotional thinking about my relationship with my right. dad, which I, I feel I'm not saying it's the same at all. Like I had a great relationship with him. And then, but then I, I kind of pieced out when I was 18, moved to New York, mm-hmm. his Parkinson's declines gets worse and worse. Ugh. I move home too late two years ago yeah. to try to like fix this relationship that I pieced out with my dad and I can't have it anymore. Oh man! I saw him the other day and he was drooling the whole time oh, and I'm trying to tell him about my life and he you know, mumbles some random stuff to me and that's it. And so you're just like, fuck, should I be mad at him? Should I be mad at me? Right, right. In in a way, and I, I, because I, before we were chatting, I, you know, was rereading parts of your book and it's like, it's, I know it's not the same, but it was, it was comforting knowing that I'm like, oh man, look at how well Nabil's doing, even though he's had to endure all sorts of, you know, things about fatherhood or lack thereof or too much or. But it's, it's such a weird situation because I, I never known him and he's never been part of our lives and it's never and that's that was the plan. He yeah. never left us. There was no divorce. Well, yeah, he's that's just the... not in the picture. So it's it's a very unique situation. Yeah, it is. It is. I mean, I would say still the biggest thing I take away from it is you and your success, right? Like I mean, obviously you're you have you have done many things that people would work their whole life to do one of. <laughs> whether it's being a band or whether it's a successful business and now this prestigious role. And also the biggest thing, your reputation. I mean, there's not a single person that, that I have interacted with in the music business that's worked or knows of you that doesn't like laugh when I mention your name. <laughs> that's nice. Good <laughs> laugh. <laughs> yeah, of course a good laugh. Let's be clear here. Yeah. <laughs> oh. um, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, that's nice to hear. That's great. I mean, yeah. And, and what's interesting is I do, and I get into this in the book, and even just writing the book made me think about this, but I think, I think some of what you're talking about, and maybe that's, whether that's ambition or passion, or, but thrive, I think those things do come more from my father than my mother. Mm. And I see it in him. I see it in the fact that he's 81 and on tour in England as we speak. He's on tour right yeah. now? Holy shit. And I'm sitting here that. like... You know, doing five interviews today, loving all of them and wishing there were six. Yeah. <laughs> Which I feel like right, is not right. what my mother would do. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I want to talk to you about music stuff yeah. now, because obviously this is very heavy and very beautiful, but I it would I would be upset if I didn't get your hot takes <laughs> on records. Okay. What would you say are three records that change your life? Ooh, interesting. To think of different periods. So early on, it just has to be Kiss Destroyer. There's a whole, there's a chapter in the book basically about it. And some of that is that I was five years old. Of course, as we mentioned, kids are really susceptible to Kiss. But like, there's a lot, there's more to it. There's something about about being a biracial kid and listening to Stevie Wonder records, but thinking like, well, my skin's not as dark as his and my afro's not as tight and I'm not, you know, so I can't do that. And there's a thing mm-hmm. about listening to the Beatles records and thinking like, well, I'm, I'm never going to be that pale or have that cool, weird, straight <laughs> hair or whatever. So I'm not that. So even though we listen to such a, you know, interesting array of male and female and artists of different races and everything, there was never anyone that really looked like me. And I think a lot of people look for that in music. They want to have somebody that they can emulate that they can aspire to be. Well, I look enough like them that I could be that person. 
And weirdly, right. I think in the strangest way, Kiss was that for me because I could put on the makeup and look like them. And there's pictures of me doing that. I mean, my mom did an incredible job of making dressing me up like Peter Chris with an afro. Um, and it was also that, like, I mean, I knew they were white men from New York. My mom knew when she told me that. But still, I wasn't actually fooled. But it was just the idea that, like, right. I could look like them because you can't tell what they look like. That could be anybody who's doing what they're doing. And I really liked that because it, it just strangely felt like the most attainable of all the bands that I saw. <laughs> it was Kiss. Yeah, thank God Blue Man Group didn't exist then. <laughs> totally. <laughs> So really, that record really like grabbed a hold of me, and I, I mean, it's still one of my favorite records, and it's hard now because it's like, well, were they that good? No, but like, it was important at the time, and you kind of can't lose what that felt like. Okay, so Kiss Destroyer, that's one. That's one. Hmm. I mean, I mean, I guess of all the sort of Seattle stuff, I have to just choose Nirvana. Never mind, because I mean, there are albums that I actually like more than that one, but that one just represents it for me because I was at the, the show the first time they played "Smells Like Teen Spirit" live. Before the oh, album shit. came out, before they recorded it. It was right before they drove to LA to record it the next day. Um, yeah. And it really, really fucked me up. There's, I, I'd never, I'd never seen them. It was a club show and it was 10 times better than the best show I'd ever seen. And I'd seen so many shows by the time I was 19. And, and I left feeling really depressed. And the reason I felt depressed was that ruined music for me. I was like, everything I've ever heard is terrible. Everything I've ever seen is terrible. I'm never going to see or hear or feel anything that good again. That's it. I, my life is ruined. I seriously felt like that when I left that show. Wow. It was really crazy. It was, didn't turn out to be yeah. true. I heard lots of good music since then. But, yeah, I was going to say. That's what I felt like when I left. It was kind of a terrible feeling. <laughs> yeah, I've, you know, my, um, my dad got to have a few interactions with uh, George Martin oh, and wow. the dudes from, um, yeah, because my dad played with um, Dan Peek. Right. And the, yeah, America dudes or whatever. And people would come up to, and this is similar, like, Paul McCartney's has talked about this too, where people would come up to him and would be like, man, sister golden hair was like my whole life. And he was like, that was so long ago. <laughs> where he was just like, what that was, you know, he's like, music has evolved. Music has changed. And he was like, move on to the next, which is kind of cold when you think about it. Cause music is like, I feel like one of the only art forms that like, it's, it's so nostalgic at the same right. time. Like I don't go and look at like a Monet mm -hmm. and, you know, have, you know, attach it to all these different things the way you do with yeah. the music, you know, it's like, but you know, some of these, like seeing a Nirvana show, because I, I kind of roll my eyes sometimes at Nirvana stuff now yeah. because the shirts are $800 and, <laughs> yeah. you know, like Dave Grohl is even like, fucking move on, right, man. Right. Like, <laughs> yeah. But to see them at that time oh. before one of the most influential records in history crazy. is, yeah. All right, what's the next album? Uh, I'm going to go with Stevie Wonder, Inner Visions, I think, which which I don't I have less of a story about. It's just, he is just such a superhuman i think he played and produced everything in that record and all those records in that classic period which is like you know five albums five years in a row all just beautiful topical timely so good in so many ways yeah, yeah. oh that, oh that's like perfect wonder because that was early 70s yeah, that's the time 73 yeah yeah oh yeah because it was right after talking book oh yeah living for the city is oh, in there God, that song. Yeah. don't you worry about a thing yeah man those are bangers <laughs> yeah, don't you worry about a thing might be my favorite song period by anyone yeah. yeah, it's that super like Latin groove. It's so good. Yeah, he was, and he's still yeah, alive. He's still doing Stevie it. Stevie Wonder's still yep. alive. Yeah, jeez, at least <laughs> yeah, I forget about that. Um, what's a movie or a book? Or well, this could be. I mean, you know, I know you. We, we already talked about albums, but like, what's a movie or book that when someone mentions, you feel they understand you? Spinal Tap. <laughs> <laughs> seriously there's it's just from years of being in bands that that movie is so spot on for how like ridiculous and satirical it is there's so many really mm -hmm. like moments that are so true to life of what it feels like to be in a band in that movie of like the sort of like sitting around and waiting or just like things not going well i mean i actually reference it twice in the book which i'm shocked that my editor wasn't like can we maybe just talk about spinal tap once not twice <laughs> <laughs> in the book, but it's just it's just that accurate and really like those guys got it way too much and i think it's it always connects it connects to work stuff all the time there are a bunch of us simon halliday and claire who are all big tap yep. heads and who make jokes all the time when something happens and we'll say like you know well i'm just out waiting for the limo or <laughs> like a spinal tap reference yeah. it happens all the time or like the puppet show <laughs> totally, like, yeah. i told them not to yeah. put the puppet show up top <laughs> yeah <laughs> All of um, that. Yes. On that, what's the strangest gig you ever played? I mean, when I was in ACS, Portland, I mean, Portland still is like a, Portland, Oregon is a weird, mm -hmm. has a weird strip club laws. 
and I think and definitely oh. always has, meaning there I think there's more per capita than anywhere. Um mm. which is really strange for like this seemingly liberal, you know, hipster northwest city. And so sure, yeah. especially then, like late nineties, early two thousands, a lot of those clubs, there were like hipster strip clubs that weren't like the cheesy, like, hey, up next is Roxanne, or like, you know, not those places <laughs> that I've heard about but never yeah. been to. But um <laughs> but more like <laughs> like you see in the movies you know oh, yeah, yeah, but yeah. more like i don't know how to describe like weird indie clubs and so we played in one once like that and i don't think we realized it until like we got there we're like is this a strip club and like yeah yeah the the women oh. will be on stage while you're playing and we're like are you kidding and and they weren't like there oh. the whole time but like we played a set to like a normal crowd and there <laughs> were women like I guess not totally stripping, kind of pole dancing, but it was super weird and awkward to be sitting behind a drum set on a strip club stage <laughs> in Portland, Oregon. That that's probably the one. Yeah, you're like, the, the, this is not our entourage. They 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 are here. They're working. <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Gotta be it. <laughs> What's the best gig you ever played? Then I mean, it was really fun when I joined the Lemons. The whole thing was that this was in what 1995. I was trying to play drums in a band. I happened to walk into a friend's office who was a manager, and he just was hanging off the phone. He or he hanging up the phone, slammed it down. He's like, "Fuck!" And I was like, "What? what what's wrong? <laughs> what's going on, Don?" He's like, "Lemon's drummer just broke his arm, and they have this huge show in a week opening for Mud Honey." And that's when I was like, "Oh well, I know those guys, and I know those songs. I can do it." And so, I just I mean, I think that they had there would have been people ahead of me in line if I hadn't just had been there at that time. So he called them, and they're like, he was like, "And had the reputation that you had." Yes, right. And so he's like, "You want to go down and go go play with them tomorrow and see how it goes?" I was like, "Of course, yeah." So I went to their practice this place and played a few songs and it went great and they're like great so th this was just like a one-time fill-in gig but it was at i think mm -hmm. the series might have ended they might still do it but right below the space needle at seattle center in seattle they did this week or yeah this weekly summer concert series they'd have like 10 shows called pain in the grass there was always mm -hmm. like big bands usually seattle bands but like whatever pearl jam like big seattle bands and thousands of people would come right and so the lemons were opening for mud honey who was huge at the time and so at the time it was the biggest crowd they'd ever had at one i think it was six thousand people and it was my first ever time playing <laughs> with the with this band, the Lemons, and uh, and it was just crazy to like. I mean, this is like you know peak '90s Seattle people with their shirts off, moshing and yeah. body passing. This is like, just like it's like yeah, a movie. They just filmed the Black Sheep <laughs> exactly. section or whatever too. So it was just yeah. really fun and like and visceral to like. I remember playing drums and feeling like, oh, weird. I mean, I'm kind of controlling this. I start the songs uh, by clicking <laughs> off my sticks and then I hit my cymbals right. and I play a beat and that's what tells the band to play and that whole thing is what tells those people to move like that. Like I was really in my head in a weird way oh, thinking wow. like this is some weird puppet master <laughs> thing <laughs> sort of. But it was just really fun and like I'd never done anything even close to that. So it was like a whole different level of like, you know, I'd otherwise just like played in my friends' bands in high school or college. But like this was such a real thing. Right. Yeah. Continuing with our series of random questions, if you were making a YouTube how-to video, what would it be? I think it would be some kind of cooking thing. It might be like... That's right. You are. You're but a like cook. an easy cook thing, not like some elaborate dish, oh. like more of a like how to make like really simple Trader Joe's fish tacos or how to make a really good smoothie or like something that like I've become... I think it's a pandemic thing. I've become more of like an efficient cook than a good cook because it's like... No one. What's the difference? Good cook, you like take your time and you make lots of, you cut lots of things and get out lots of dishes and make things dirty and it like, you know, becomes like a really special thing. And mm, I just like, okay. when it's like, well, now for, I mean, for a while, obviously, it was like, couldn't do that every night. And so it became yeah. like, you like an instant pot guy? Yeah, we have an instant pot and I love that. But cooking just became less fun because it, it used to be something that like, you know, go out a lot or go out for work a lot. And so cooking was like, oh, this is going to be fun. I'm going to cook on Saturday and I'm going to do like a big thing. Right. And when it became like the way to eat, most of the time, it just became a lot more functional. Like, okay, let's we do something that doesn't dirty every dish and doesn't take three hours or whatever. So I've gotten better at those kinds of things. And I think it would be like a sort of like whatever top five easiest, fastest, least dish <laughs> recipes that still taste good. <laughs> right. Yeah. The I, It's funny because like David Chang does his like YouTube videos right. and they're all like microwave chicken and stuff. Like it's it's things that like people actually really do cook versus like, oh, make sure you have your, you know, sorry knife and, you know, you're going to take the dovetail of this. And like, it's, it's very more, it's just much more normal mm -hmm. when he's like, yeah, I, I'll cook this chicken in the microwave and then I'm going to do this and this and put my, you know, and this is what I eat like five nights right, a week. Right. Uh, it's, yeah. Um, Nabil, 
this was a ton of fun. Awesome. Thank uh, you for thank having you, me. Thank you for chatting. Great. Thank you. I will talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening. Be sure to check out Nabil Ayer's book, My Life in the Sunshine, Searching for My Father and Discovering My Family, available everywhere. You can also listen to the audiobook on Audible. It's great. Nabil reads it. Check it out. Visit NabilAyers.com for more info. You've been listening to Blamo. We're edited by Amar Lal, our music by Breakmaster Cylinder, and we're produced by Blamo Media. If you like the show, tell a friend, give us some good vibes. You can follow us on social media at Blamo Podcast or email us at info at Sound good? I'll see you all soon. <laughs>